Good afternoon. afternoon. I'm Maggie Evans from the Office of the President, and I'd like to welcome you here on Constitution Day Eve for this year's first lecture in the Madison Vision Series. I'd like to remind everyone once again to please turn off your cell phones or any devices. And additionally, if there are any students here in attendance that need to receive their passport stamp, that st those stamps will be available in the lobby after the question and answer portion of today's lecture. Through the Madison Vision Series, we will work to elevate civil discourse on our campus by bringing prominent thinkers and leaders who help us look at the current civic landscape from different perspectives and to think about what it means to create enlightened citizens as we work to become the model of the engaged university. Through the Madison Vision Fund, we are proud to sponsor this series and we want to thank our co-sponsor, the Office of Madison Institutes in, in Outreach and Engagement, as well as the supporters of the Madison Fund who have made this series possible. I would now like to welcome to the stage JMU President John Alger to introduce this year's Constitution Day speaker for the Madison Vision Series, President Alger. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see you all, and I feel like I'm in very good company. That's James Madison behind us, in case you didn't notice. Uh, he actually came from Alumni Hall, so we'll make sure he gets back safely, right, Maggie? Uh, but it's, it's really a, a great thrill to be here with all of you to celebrate Constitution Day in 2016. And you all know, of course, that the Constitution serves to this day as the legal foundation for our country. And as you might have noticed in the uh, current political dialogue, that it continues to be widely debated and dissected, although often people actually haven't read the document. Uh, as an institution named, though, for the father of the Constitution, and one that strives to emphasize not just the rights of citizens, but also their responsibilities. It's crucial that we at JMU continue to focus our attention on the Constitution. At JMU, we must not lose sight of the principles that are set forth by our founding fathers, while we also seek to understand and appreciate the incredible adaptability of the document that continues to serve as the law of the land. This conversation, I think, could not be any more important than it is right now at this stage of our history, a time when we often see tremendous divisions and incivility that almost paralyze us and here we are heading into yet another presidential election cycle where that often seems to be the case. But today is a day for hope and for optimism. It's a day that we celebrate not just the Constitution, but really even more than the 4th of July, this marks the founding of our country because it's the time when we really articulated and, form and formalized the ideas that define and shape how this new experimental democracy would survive and thrive for centuries to come. So I'm pleased to note that on this Constitution Day, or actually a day early, but you may have noticed that students were out uh, passing out copies of the Constitution. I hope some of you got your copy. I think there are still more around on campus, uh, but do read it. Uh, there's a reason that we like to give these out. Uh, and as we celebrate the Constitution, we also want to continue to study it here at JMU. Now, as we continue our celebration, we do want to invite you to join the fun on Saturday. If you haven't heard yet, we are sending a contingent to Montpelier, which of course is the historic home of James and Dolly Madison, not far from here, and a, a very dear partner with our institution in many endeavors. So they will be hosting their Constitution Day celebration on Saturday, and there are still limited slots available, so you can visit the JMU Constitution Day website to register for that trip. I also want to share a few other details about some of the civic engagement initiatives here at JMU, particularly that are happening this fall before I introduce our honored guest. Some of you may have voted in the newly established JMU voting precinct right here on campus this past spring. And I'm hoping that perhaps even more of you will be taking advantage of that this fall. We're really proud of the fact that we're hosting a voting precinct on our own campus. And I know there are folks out here in the audience who are a big part of that. So to help you be prepared, Duke's Vote will continue to facilitate voter registration across campus. 
Additionally, as you prepare for the election, we have many resources to offer, such as previous Madison Vision Series lectures, the mobile app iCitizen, and a new website I want to bring to your attention called BallotReady.org. Hopefully by now you're familiar with iCitizen. Uh, if not, you can download that app and explore it. It's a great way to add your voice to the national dialogue on lots of important issues of our time. But BallotReady.org is also something that will be a great tool for us. It will be generating fully accessible ballots for you to review ahead of time before you vote, listing all of the races that will appear on your ballot and making it easy for every voter to research the candidates on the ballot and make informed decisions based on what they care about. Ballot Ready will provide free, nonpartisan background information on every candidate and referendum on a voter's ballot. Their mission is to create a country where every voter can enter the voting booth prepared and ballot ready, which aligns, as you can tell, very closely with our JMU mission of preparing students to be educated and enlightened citizens. Once you've made your informed vote, we hope that you'll join us on election night in the festival ballroom for a JMU election night viewing party. And who knows how late that will go. Uh, so watch for more information on this event over the next two months and do please come. It will be an exciting night on campus and everybody is invited. So these are just a few of the efforts as we head into this busy season that will help to make JMU that national model of the engaged university, engaged with ideas and the world. And now, as we celebrate this 229th anniversary of the signing of the Constitution, let me introduce today's speaker, Mr. John M. Bridgeland. John, or Bridge, as he is known to his friends, is a great friend of JMU and the Commonwealth of Virginia. We've been working with Bridge, as well as the governor and the first lady of Virginia, and with our colleagues at higher education institutions across the Commonwealth on what is now known as the Virginia Compact on National Service, an exciting collaboration that reflects the mission of the National Service Year Alliance, of which Bridge is the vice chair. The goal of the Service Year Alliance is to make a year of service a common expectation and opportunity for all 18 to 28 year olds in our country. JMU is proud to be supporting three Service Year Fellows, two of whom I think are here today, here on campus as well as with our partners at Montpelier. John Bridgeland, has a very distinguished career in service that you'll get a sense of today. He began, as most law students do, and I have to say me included, with the practice of law, although at a more prestigious law firm than a lot of other uh, freshly minted lawyers. Even while practicing law, though, he found ways to give back through his pro bono efforts. And as many lawyers do, he moved on from the day-to-day -day practice of law to serve not one, but two different US presidential administrations in varying roles. He served as director of the White House Domestic Policy Council, assistant to the President of the United States, and first director of the USA Freedom Corps under President George W. Bush. And then he was subsequently appointed by President Obama to serve on the White House Council for Community Solutions a pretty impressive background to work in both of those administrations. Unlike most lawyers, Bridge has appeared twice on Oprah Winfrey's show. He'll have to tell us about that, perhaps. His book, Heart of the Nation, which, by the way, will be available and which he will be signing following today's lecture, has been described as an exciting and authentic account of a presidential initiative to foster our civic spirit after 9-11 from a top official inside the White House. Bridge is currently the founder and CEO of Civic Enterprises, which also, while also serving as vice chair of the Service Year Alliance. It's been my honor to work closely with Bridge on promoting the Service Year concept throughout the Commonwealth. With John Bridgeland's guidance and inspiration, over the past few months, we've obtained signatures from 100% of Virginia's public colleges and universities, as well as almost all of the private institutions, to commit to service year initiatives on their campuses. We're looking forward to see this concept take wings, not just in Virginia, but across the country. And as Bridge will share, it begins with each of you and with all of us. 
So it's now my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Mr. John Bridgeland to deliver his lecture, Citizenship, Big Ideas, and You. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Alger. I wish there were a ranking of favorite uh, college presidents in the United States because you would, you would top my list. Uh, working with John over the last two years has been an extraordinary experience. Um, he's a leader that doesn't just believe in civic engagement and creates a culture on this campus where literally the, the students and the faculty and the deans and the administrators live and breathe it. Um, he puts things into action, as you'll hear in a minute. Uh, because of John's leadership and in partnership with uh, Taylor Reevely at William & Mary, uh, nearly every college president in the Commonwealth of Virginia is now behind this big idea of uh, making it a common rite of passage for young people, what it means to be educated in, in a higher education institution. Part of that experience uh, will be a service year or a significant service experience. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here at James Madison. It's both inspiring and a little intimidating. Uh, to be in the place um, uh, of a person, literally a person, uh, who embodies in, in, in such a powerful way everything I'm gonna talk about today. Um, but it's also a reminder the reality of these people who've been so mythologized, we forget who they are and what they represented. And as I think back on the life of James Madison, a uh, colonel in the Virginia militia, a co-author of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which as you all know, Thomas Jefferson has as one of the three items on his gravestone. Uh, someone who goes on to serve in the Congress. Um, supervises, as I remember it, the Louisiana Purchase as Secretary of State under Thomas Jefferson, which doubled the size of the nation. Talk about a big idea. Goes on to be um, uh, such an extraordinary leader in the Con uh, Continental Congress and the Constitutional Convention. And when you read some of the notes from the diaries of those delegates who were commenting, and I think he was the youngest, or among the youngest uh, delegates to the uh, uh, convention at 36 years old. Um, they talk about Madison being able to talk about any issue in a more sophisticated fashion than anyone else uh, in the delegation. Of course, goes on to, to father the Constitution, co-author the Federalist Papers, write the Virginia Plan, and write the Bill of Rights. Um, when we think of big citizenship in the country, and of course I didn't even mention he was fourth president of the United States, <laughs> just like Jefferson, it's not even on his tombstone, uh, which actually says something and um, sort of undergirds the purpose of my uh, talk today. So when, when John was kind enough, and you're all kind enough on a beautiful day, you know, to come here in the middle of the afternoon um, to engage in this conversation, um, to ask me to do the Madison Lecture, I, I was thrilled to do it in large part because of the wonderful partnership we have, not just to talk about citizenship, not just to talk about engagement, uh, but to live and breathe it and try to provide opportunities for more young people uh, in the United States to experience it. So today I wanna to talk about um, citizen service, this extraordinary tradition. After 9-11, um, when I was literally in the bunker under the White House, we were grounding every plane into the United States, um, and then I was summoned, uh, went over to the um, uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency to ensure that the response to these, what we'd learn later, these three areas that were under attack, uh, was proceeding apace and literally carried the emergency declaration back to the White House for the President to sign to release aid. Um, when I went back up to my West Wing office, there were 556 emails from people across the United States, most of whom I didn't know, who were um, sending the message, how could they help, what, they, what could they do, um, how could they help contribute in the aftermath of this terrible dis disaster in the United States. But in that context, one of the first things I did was reach out to David McCullough and other historians and then charged my team to look at, because um, the president, two days later in the Oval Office, said, I want to create a, uh, an initiative that will foster a culture of service, citizenship, and responsibility for decades to come, and we reached out and looked at what was the national service and volunteer service tradition in the United States dating back to Washington, what could we learn from it, and how could we build on it? And it had such an impact on my life. Um, it's part of my talk today. I also have had the privilege of working on a, a few initiatives 
you know, in the, in the state of the country with our national dialogue and debate, the presidential election, uh, which I think for the first time in modern memory is, is not so much a campaign of ideas um, and policies and things that can awaken and inspire us uh, as a people and help us fulfill our great potential. I wanted to come in today, not with that somber message, but highlighting hope spots of where citizens in the United States are taking extraordinary steps to improve um, and advance um, uh, great causes in our country. And then I wanted to end with um, this wonderful author, Dan Bornstein, who wrote a book on social entrepreneurship. And he talks about what's your scratch on history? Because I think too often we hear talks or we talk ourselves, and then it doesn't get personalized down to what can, and by the way, I'm seeing some of the students that I intersected with this morning. We had two hours of fabulous discussion. I have the privilege of, of intersecting with a lot of college students. And, and JMU just lives and breathes engagement. Uh, and in fact, some of the ideas that were generated out of the, the second class today, we're going to take back to our service year alliance. Uh, really wonderful ideas um, to inform the initiative. So. The founders um, worried, as I think John alluded to, that in building a country so strongly premised on rights that future generations distant from the sacrifices of the revolution, which were just extraordinary, um, would, for, would neglect their duties. And so, you know, George Washington, and he's so mythologized, we forget, you know, what he went through. He lost the Battle of Brooklyn, the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, the Battle of Manhattan, the Battle of Harlem Heights, the Battle of the Fort, that would be named after him, Fort Washington, has a, you know, a band of citizens, volunteer army, often not paid, often not clothed. Stan McChrystal talks about the experience at Valley Forge. Um, and he literally dedicates nearly 50 years of his life to the service of a nation. And at the end of the war, 1783, when his, his men are you know, clamoring for their pensions. There's basically a riot. I think it becomes known as the Newburgh Conspiracy in Newburgh, New York. He comes into the session. He's sympathetic to his men, um, but he's stumbling over his words. And you probably know this wonderful story. I've told it to my children again and again. And he pulls out a pair of glasses and he says, excuse me, gentlemen, but I'm, I'm nearly blind and gray in service to my country. And the men wept. They got behind him. Uh, they didn't um, uh, mutiny, and uh, because he literally had been by their side, you know, serving the country for so long. And so when he said um, uh, that we ought, you know, to put service at the center of what it means to be an American, and that we, when we assumed the soldier, we did not lay down the citizen, that really meant something. And I, uh, we have a motto in our little family, which is, think of George, <laughs> because whenever things get tough, you think of what that man went through in terms of defeat after defeat after defeat, and what it must have taken in terms of belief and faith in the American idea and the American spirit. Um, and so think of George. John Adams would say, our duty to serve our country ends but with our lives. James Madison, who, uh, 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 Thomas Jefferson, who pens that this mystical notion of the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration, which then James Madison tries to get into the Bill of Rights, doesn't succeed, but 41 state constitutions have this notion of the pursuit of happiness in their state constitutions. And it's, of course, the substitute for property and the feudal system that we were throwing off. But what's interesting about it is later in their lives, after a terrible feud, Jefferson and Adams uh, write back and forth to one another. And they talk about how happiness with a capital H isn't just an individual right, more cars, you know, more vacations, more pleasure, but the public happiness. It's something that we help one another achieve. It's a collective enterprise. And so I think that sort of undergirds the great American idea that, you know, I just don't worry about myself and my economic self-interest or even just my education. I need to worry and have an obligation that if my neighbor or if um, my colleague uh, needs a helping hand, that I have an obligation to that. Now, James Madison actually worried so much about this notion of rights and responsibilities that he and Washington envisioned a national university 
and he goes before the Congress and he talks about it, it will be central to foster those liberal sentiments, those great ideas, uh, to build a generation that they're not born with the habits of citizen, but they will, they will learn them over time. And the whole point was to cement our union. And so when I think of the context of today of you know, a divided nation, parties at war, people not knowing one another, Robert Putnam's book, Our Kids, which says that if you grow up on the wrong side of the tracks and you're low income, this is the first time in history that you're not likely to do better than your parents, even if you work hard and play by the rules. We have a country that um, can use some big ideas, and I think one of them is, is national service. So I, I, if you'll indulge me just for a minute, because I think it's, it's uh, pretty interesting. Um, it was really not until the 20th century that the largest experiment in civilian national service took off. It's March 1933. We're four years into the Great Depression. There are literally men and women who were festering on the streets. Uh, Roosevelt, who had experiences, uh, um, you know, mobilized, has his own experiences of seeing the power of nature and being in the woods and doing productive work, uh, has an idea. He calls Congress into emergency. Imagine this today. He calls Congress into emergency session in March 1933. And within weeks, he has his Civilian Conservation Corps. And let's just listen to him. There, there may be some funky music in the background, but let's, let's hear him. So here he, he, in a bold move, calls Congress into session. With it, by summer, he has 250,000 young unemployed men on our public lands, serving the country, doing really important work, and being able to send $30 every month home to their families, and he gets them off the streets. Over a decade, by 1942, nine years after the Civilian Conservation Corps, and of course when, when World War II came, uh, all the men and women were, you know, focused on the war effort abroad or at home, and the civilian conservation closes down. But over that decade, three billion trees are planted, 800 parks, national, state, local, are developed, 84 million acres of public land is saved from so soil erosion, given proper agricultural drainage, 84 million acres is actually the entire size of our national park system today. And interestingly, we've, um, there's still CCC boys alive. And we've had them at our conferences. And they come and they talk about uh, not the economic interest, not the, even the, the public purposes that were met to meet the needs of the nation. It was almost like a spiritual experience where together they were brought together black and white, rich and poor, mostly poor, um, from all different parts of the country in common purpose to do something big and bold for America. And it informed and shaped the rest of their lives. Um, John Kennedy had just debated Richard Nixon in October of 1960. My, mo my mother tells me that Kennedy won on TV and Nixon won on the radio. And... Um, uh, at that night, he goes to the University of Michigan. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. There are 10,000 students from uh, Michigan waiting to hear him. And he's actually, you know, sort of coming in, exhausting day. He's ready to go to bed. And he makes an off-the-cuff, kind of last-minute set of remarks to the students.
Okay. Whoa. Help. Sean. There we go. Uh, by the way, I wanted to thank George and Sean and the whole team here at Forbes. They've been fabulous. This is one of the most beautiful settings uh, I've ever had the chance to, to uh, participate in. But so Kennedy goes, he gives us, I, I talked to Ted Sorensen, who is his chief of staff, and he said, you know, uh, Senator Kennedy sort of spoke off the cuff. It wasn't really a serious policy proposal. I mean, policy proposals are usually the subject of lots of work and energy. And, and, and this is more directed to the JMU students. So Alan and Judy Guskin were students at the University of Michigan. And they're still alive, and I've gotten to know them, and I've heard their wonderful story. They go into a nearby cafe, and on a little napkin, they say that if he starts it wasn't even called the Peace Corps yet, but if he starts this program, they will sign up. And they initiate a scroll that they circulate around to hundreds of colleges around the United States. And within two weeks, there are thousands of students who've signed this scroll. And they contact the White House, they get Sorensen, and Sorensen says, get that to us. And so all of a sudden, because of the students in the country who had an appetite to do something larger than just their, you know, their own economic interest, they uh, literally initiated, it was, it was the students who started the Peace Corps. And Kennedy went back, or Sergeant Shriver went back to University of Michigan and made, made that very case. But Kennedy said the Peace Corps would be truly serious when we had 100,000 Americans serving around the world every year. Imagine the impact that would have on understand foreign languages and cultures and religions and systems and governments. And we have about 7,200 today. And imagine, he said, um, we'd have a more informed foreign policy. And Dean Rusk, as Secretary of State, says that the Peace Corps is effective because uh, it's not formal diplomacy, it's a diplomacy of deeds. And so I think the Peace Corps, in terms of international reach and service is such a powerful idea that we're all working to expand. So Lyndon Johnson goes to, are you still with me? Okay. Lyndon Johnson goes to Tom Fletcher's front porch in Martin County, Kentucky, one of the most impoverished areas of the United States. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. I've been to Martin County. I've been to Tom Fletcher's front porch. Um, and he announces his war on poverty at a time when you look at the statistics, it, it's mind blowing how much poverty there was in the United States, and um, that epitomized in Appalachia uh, some of the deepest, uh, darkest uh, poverty in the country. And so he goes to Fletcher's front porch and he launches something called, uh, is part of the war on poverty, and he puts, by the way, Sergeant Shriver, who became a mentor to me after 9-11, and tells me this wonderful story of how Shriver had done the Peace Corps, he had just lost his brother-in-law, he had just organized the funeral. It was a very difficult, uh, horrific time in the life of the country. And Johnson goes out and announces that Sergeant Shriver's gonna run the war on poverty before he cleared it with Sergeant Shriver. And so um, Sarge had this wonderful vision that you know, created Job, Job Corps and Head Start, and you almost can't think of a program in the 1960s on the domestic agenda that didn't emerge out of that man, my, uh, man's mind and office. And one of them was volunteers in, in uh, service to America. Any VISTAs in the room? Any Peace Corps volunteers in the room? There were a bunch of JMU students who were going off, to, it's so dark I can't quite see, but who were going off to the Peace Corps. And so now we have 7,000 VISTAs a year who serve in mostly rural areas, increasing the capacity of nonprofit and faith-based and community-based organizations to help the poor and needy. Ronald Reagan at the Republican National Convention. It's so interesting because there are all these uh, Democrats like Harris Wofford who love to quote him. like a deep and mighty river through the history of our nation. 
what wonderful words. He establishes the Office of Private Sector Initiatives, and then his, his vice president, who becomes President George H.W. Bush, establishes the Points of Light Foundation, which is the largest volunteer um, service organization in the world today. Bill Clinton, who's just such a complete force of energy and ideas, and I've had the privilege of briefing him, and it, it's one of the most satisfying experiences because he has such an appetite for policy and ideas, and the exchange is so rich. And he says, you know, why don't we have this big idea of, just like we did for the military, if we, if you invest in your country and you serve, there'll be the GI Bill when you come back. So if you did a year of service in what became AmeriCorps, sort of a domestic Peace Corps, then we'll invest in you and your education. And so if you serve in AmeriCorps today, you get an education award. And I think one of the big ideas uh, that's being talked about on the campaign, including debt-free college for low-income Americans, is if, if you step forward and serve your country, you ought to get um, loan forgiveness or uh, relief with respect to education. Today, there are 65,000 Americans, uh, young Americans mostly, in AmeriCorps. Bush, after 9-11, Sorry, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the call. So it becomes the largest national service program since the Civilian Conservation Corps in terms of number of people engaged. This Medical Reserve Corps, which we worked with in the context of the Homeland Security effort and emerged out of the Situation Room that we were in three times a day after 9-11 when my job went from fashioning domestic policy to worrying about hardened assets and, and domestic consequences and our whole lens changed. But in it, too, there was such a, um, I went to Ground Zero in, um, in New York City, and I noticed how much support was rushing in to help. And they literally had to hire trucking operations to carry the excess of American compassion away from that place, because it was interfering <laughs> with some of the response. Um, that's just so fabulous. You know, that's, that's the spirit uh, that Americans have always had and continue to have. And, um, but just one little piece of the Freedom Corps, the Medical Reserve Corps has more than 200,000 uh, trained doctors and nurses and pharmacists and dentists in it. And they respond in the aftermath of not just waiting for, you know, the next terrorist attack, but places like Katrina and other natural disasters or man-made disasters in the United States. Um, we increased AmeriCorps, we increased Peace Corps. But even then, there are five times the number of people who sign up for AmeriCorps every day than there are positions. After 9-11, I, I called the director of the Peace Corps and I said, how does it look? He said, well, we have 133,000 applications. And I said, that's wonderful. How many slots do we have? He said, 5,500. 
So I visited with every member of Congress. Uh, the president had to make calls. We grew the Peace Corps significantly, but nothing close to what Kennedy uh, wanted, and every president has tried to, to uh, grow it, um, and there's more progress to, to be made. I want to just touch, uh, if you're still with me, um, so that's the citizen service tradition in the United States, and President Obama, um, just transformational leader in so many ways. One of the first acts that he uh, undertakes in his administration is to sign the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act into law, which is authorizing the growth in AmeriCorps and some of these programs I've been talking about. And then it sort of stalls out in Congress and doesn't get funded. Um, but a wonderful little story experience I had was at, at Ted Ke Senator Kennedy. Uh, I get this phone call. I'm driving through rural Kentucky to do this high school dropout summit in the middle of nowhere. And I get this call, and he said, um, uh, Bridge, remember when my brother talked about um, passing a torch? And I said, well, I was three years old, but you know, I used to listen to it later. And he said, we really blowtorch this thing. And he just let out this big laugh. And I thought, you know, here's this man who's got brain cancer. He's in a hospital. He's dedicated his whole life um, to public service. And, you know, he's calling somebody like me, a lousy Republican, right, uh, to say, you know, we did something in terms of laying the architecture. It became the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act, named by conservative Republican Orrin Hatch on the Senate floor. And I thought, God, why don't we have, I had this experience where the Bush Library was dedicated. All five living presidents were on stage. And I looked at Jimmy Carter, who, you know, outlived cancer and probably the most successful post-president in terms of his contributions to the world after a difficult presidency. And I looked at George H.W. Bush in the wheelchair and all he had done, and Bill Clinton and all he gave to the country, and, and uh, George W. Bush and all he did, um, including keeping the American people safe after 9-11, and looked at this vibrant young President Obama, and I thought, God, why don't we harness the power and ability and ideas across administration for greater public good? And what is it about our system that needs to change to make that happen? So I wanted to highlight very briefly just three great examples of big ideas led by citizens. You all know John Muir, you know, that Scotsman who has this big idea to put large tracts of land into federal custody for the protection of future generations for all time. You know, sort of the great democratic idea where, you know, a czar doesn't own the most beautiful public land, lands in, in the country. The, the American people do. It's a, a great democratic idea. But what, what's powerful about the parks idea, and, you know, William Henry Jackson goes into Yellowstone. He's a photographer, takes photographs and shows them to the Congress. And then U.S. Grant puts it into federal protection. The Organic Act, which is literally 100 years ago, August 25th, Woodrow Wilson signs into law this fabulous act that creates the National Park Service to leave these treasures, which I call the collective conscious of our nation, in um, federal protection for all time for the enjoyment and use of future generations. Uh, by the 25th, uh, FDR, puts the White House, military battlefields, parks become history, places where young people can uh, learn about American history and why it was important. By the 50th, uh, Mission 66, people in parks, they build the infrastructure uh, to make um, the millions of people who visit their national parks every year. But what's so great is this idea is not ending there. Um, the next 100 years need to be the blue centennial. And Sylvia Earle, who is a great oceanographer. She's called her deepness. She's um, the first chief scientist at NOAA who uh, was a woman. She broke the, the, the barriers for women. Um, and she has uh, been leading this effort. I have the privilege of working with her uh, to bring the national park idea, which Americans understand, to oceans, given that 54% of the United States is now underwater in that when you go out to the US exclusive economic zone, 200 miles, which is our jurisdiction, um, most of the United States is blue. And the oceans are dying. 90% of the large fish are gone. When we go out on these expeditions in US waters, fishermen come 
come up to us and they want to see Sylvia because they want to ask Sylvia for protected areas or safe havens. And um, so a month ago, we were in Hawaii and Sylvia was on Midway Atoll with President Obama. And he created, uh, by expanding Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, it's the largest marine reserve in the world, half a million square miles of protected ocean, larger than the size of Texas and California combined, 7,000 marine species. And just today at 10 o'clock this morning, uh, President Obama created the first national marine monument in the Atlantic. And so the idea is to create a necklace of parks, of blue parks in the ocean um, that will uh, help preserve the air we breathe, the water we drink, the climate cycle, uh, and also the uh, spawning grounds for fish. Um, so the uh, oceans will survive. But that was really generated by a private citizen, Sylvia Earle and a group who, you know, working with Pew, Charitable Trust, and other uh, philanthropies and organizations uh, to bring a big idea and to make it happen. Another was um, 12 years ago, um, this man, Ray Chambers, we spent about $30 million a year in the United States on malaria control, even though in the United States, uh, malaria was, um, was here, and it was eradicated in the United States by 1951. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was created in the United States to, to end malaria. Uh, and of course, uh, we wiped it out um, by the early 1950s. But it was killing, needlessly killing 1.2 million uh, people in the world, mostly um, mothers and children under five in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's a totally preventable and treatable disease with four interventions, malaria, in, 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 insecticide-treated bed nets, uh, indoor residual spraying, um, uh, Artemis and, and combination therapies, which is sort of a cocktail drug from plants in China, and China's, China, the Chinese have had a leading role in it. Uh, that uh, treat malaria, and then this IPT for pregnant women. And this falciparin, uh, plasmodium falciparin, which is the parasite that's been around since the time of the dinosaurs, is very complex to address, has now, um, with the setting of two goals, uh, universal coverage of bed nets, that if a family sleeps under a bed net, one bed net saves about two lives. Um, and then by the end of 2015, the goal was to end malaria deaths. And it was a private citizen, Ray Chambers, who was a businessman and started a philanthropy, um, who really led this whole coalition of Gates Foundation. Now he's the US, UN Special Envoy for Malaria. Government tapped him to coordinate efforts uh, with the Global Fund, Gates Foundation, World Bank, et cetera. Uh, and then connecting up to the President's Malaria Initiative, 6.3 million lives have been saved. Think about that, 6.3 million lives have been saved. And we'll find out at the end of this year how close we got to the zero deaths goal. So much so that Bill and Melinda Gates and others came together and said, now we're working to end malaria deaths in Africa. Let's get a plan together to eliminate it, eradicate it. Um, so another hope spot for the world and there's no domestic constituency, there's no member of Congress that has a constituent that cares about malaria. But just to show you how great the American people are, we went to American Idol and we said, you reach everybody. And any chance you could help us raise support for malaria bed nets. So they called us back in a week and they said, uh, we're gonna do a show called Idol Gives Back. And in two nights, for three years in a row, we may raised about $78 million from the American people for malaria bed nets. And so the American people have had a huge, with public and private resources, impact on, on addressing malaria. So I'm almost done. Are you still with me? Stan McChrystal, uh, commanding troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, comes back from that experience. And I've gotten to know General McChrystal really well. And um, I think so highly of him. He used to go out um, on sorties with his men and women. He wanted to, to understand what they were experiencing. He wanted to gather intelligence. He wanted to really be connected. He takes over the Joint Special Operations Command, which is totally dysfunctional, uh, and uh, creates a team of teams and a, a system that really empowers individuals closest 
to information on the ground in a way that transforms JSOC and becomes highly effective. He comes back to the United States. He's at Aspen Ideas Fest. Anybody ever go to Aspen Ideas Fest? And he's interviewed by, by Bob Schieffer on leadership. And he says, you know, for the first time in history during war, less than 1% of our population is serving in the military, leading to the complacent assumption that serving the country is somebody else's job. And he notes there's almost no connection between the prosecution of our wars abroad and their understanding of them back home. And when you think about World War II or the American Revolution or e efforts where the US population is so centrally engaged in the war effort, either in the military or Rosie the Riveters, um, and you think about our wars today and the disconnection between those serving abroad and obligations at home, he goes on to call for large-scale civilian national service and Walter Isaacson, who runs Aspen, called me a week later and said, it got a thunderous reaction. Could we do something with it? And I said, you know, the last time we had a uh, military officer involved in national service in the United States was when George C. Marshall organized 33 civilian conservation corps camps. We sure could. So we went and visited with General McChrystal, and he's uh, been the chair of our service year alliance for three and a half years. Um, which has an extraordinary vision, which is to grow national service from 65,000 positions today to one million full-time civilian national service opportunities within a decade, which would be the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And we have milestones along the way. But what's also powerful about it is we came to John Alger and Taylor Reevely. And we said, Sergeant Shriver in his 1961 memo to President Kennedy didn't want to just create a federal program called the Peace Corps. In his memo, he talks and goes on and on and on about how he wants the Peace Corps to run through colleges and universities. Great recruiting grounds for smart young people like these who were in the class this morning. Uh, connections to faculty and training. There's one partnership with uh, Columbia University in East Africa in the Peace Corps to send teachers over to East Africa. And there's a pilot partnership with Father Hesburgh at Notre Dame, because Father Hesburgh did everything. <laughs> and other than that, there was no manifestation of the Peace Corps on college campuses. But we came to John Alter, and he said, oh, I think, in fact, it's core to the mission, and we heard this, the briefing, uh, this morning on the strategic plan of engaged learning leading to civic engagement. Uh, that's like it's the, 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 the lifeblood of James Madison University. And he said, I have a vision that what it means to be educated in America, part of that is absolutely this idea of serving your community, your country, your world. And he not only talks about it, he goes out with the governor and the first lady they host these two summits here, another at William and Mary. And now we have, and Maggie Evans, who's been a total force behind this initiative, we've got 100% of the publics, 100% of the privates, and well, we have nearly every college in Virginia stepping up to innovate with us on translating a service year into opportunities for young people to serve who are either before, during, or after college to get course credit so it's part of the pipeline to success, uh, to join our service year ex exchange, which Silicon Valley has helped us uh, create and innovate around. And here at James Madison, we met with two of the fellows today, but the Valley Scholars Program, uh, Xavier, you here? Can you stand up? You deserve to be recognized. This man, let's clap for him. So imagine the big idea of mobilizing a JMU graduate to go into places in the Commonwealth of Virginia where there are young people who grow up in families where they'd be the first one even to think about, let alone go to college. Well, Xavier is making that opportunity available for so many young people. That will not only change their life trajectory, but think about how that changes the culture of a school and a community that sees a future 
I met today with uh, Madeline Ross. Maddie, are you here? Maddie, I think, had class. Uh, maybe she's here. Maddie, you here? Maddie's up top. Stand up, Maddie. You deserve a round of applause, too. So Maddie, Maddie works at the Institute for Innovation in Health and Human Services. We met with the director. Uh, she wants to pursue a career in public health. She's going to ground that knowledge and that interest in the reality of what it means to serve others and work um, uh, in uh, the health field here in the Commonwealth. And then we have a fabulous person, Claudia, uh, JMU does, who's partnering with Malpelier um, and is so busy because it's on the eve of Constitution Day, she couldn't be with us today. Well, that's good. She's doing, doing uh, the good work of, of civic education. But I just wanted to publicly thank President Alger because I get the privilege of talking to a lot of college presidents and a lot of people who have wonderful visions. But it's actually kind of rare to see somebody who takes a big, bold vision and then translates it into action, not just for the institution itself. So today we have 289 colleges and universities who are doing one of a menu of very concrete, specific things to advance this idea of embedding a significant service experience, a service year, into the higher education experience. Tufts, Tufts University said, well, we want to create classes of people who march through this university and form our school culture. So they're supporting 100 service year fellows, people who are admitted to Tuft, Tufts. They're deferred. They do their service year. They work in teams. It's domestic and abroad. And then they come in, and they're part of this service year class in Tufts that informs the whole culture of the school. And so it's really taking off, and, and uh, you have your president here, JMU, to thank. Um, even when I was at the White House and we go deep on issues, I always notice again and again and again, the beginning of the story was typically not government, but individual citizens who had a belief in themselves, had acquired the knowledge and the skills, and then had enough faith to understand that they could literally change the world. And when I think of people like Sylvia Earle, bringing the National Park idea to oceans, Ray Chambers, any malaria deaths in, in Africa, Bob Nixon, the Hollywood film producer, comes to Washington, D.C. and sees all these kids uh, literally um, in the middle of gunfire and gang violence and puts them to work cleaning up the Anacostia River and they bring back the bald eagle, the nation's symbol to the nation's capital and they have a different view of themselves, not as problems to be solved, but as potential to be unleashed. Um, I know that the hope in um, big citizenship is what I think is going to rescue back um, the country. And when you look at all the great social movements, the revolution to civil rights, to efforts today, they're, they're largely from the ground up. And, and people like Martin Luther King, he didn't wait around. He didn't have any public imprimatur. My, my favorite person in life, an example, was Sergeant Shriver. He never held elective office, but he and his wife Eunice, who started the Special Olympics, probably had more impact on more people around the world than maybe any public official of his day, of their day. Um, government can bring these things to scale uh, with clear goals, evidence-based act, plans of action, smart implementation and accountability for results over time, you know, we can make a huge difference. And just finally, um, you know, if we're serious about this pursuit of happiness, it's not my happiness, it's not your happiness, it's our happiness. It's something we help one another achieve. And interestingly, uh, the president's science advisor in 2000 three came rushing into my office and said, Bridge, read this report. And it was from top neuroscience, uh, neuroscientists around the country who had just done this major study that showed that when we serve, even when it's contrary to our, you know, our economic or other self-interests, it triggers regions of the brain that make us happier and healthier and boosts cognition. And I thought, my God, in an age of anxiety and depression and people being worried about the future of the country, service is something concrete. We can't all necessarily affect the election. We can't all necessarily affect where we go to war, what we do, but we can in our unique way identify causes and problems that we can take on and then serve greatly 
to make a difference. And so I just wanted to end. I, President Obama said that when you serve, you connect in an improbable way your own improbable story to the larger American story. And Benjamin Rush who was a founding father and brought, brought Adams and Jefferson back together after they'd feuded for years. That was a great public service. Said that when you really, I mean, these two men who had this correspondence that, you know, shaped and reshaped history, Benjamin Rush said that when you serve today, you not only connect yourselves to millions of Americans in the past, many of whom literally died to, to advance and protect our freedom, but you connect yourselves to millions of people in the future the, whose the future that they will inherit is built upon the legacy of service you leave them. So I, I try to think and try to remind my children uh, to be bold, to think of big ideas or get behind big ideas, and uh, continually ask the question, you know, what's your scratch on history? And when you look back and you look at this man here and you think about his, you know, realistically, really, what, what Madison did, uh, which I think he had more of an impact institutionally in, in building our democracy than probably any other person. It doesn't have to be that big. It can be mentoring and tutoring, tutoring a child in a low performing school. It can be cleaning up a river or park. It could be figuring out why the same people are coming through the same food lines and what we can do to really help them. Um, it can be serving in a village in Rwanda uh, to end, uh, help end uh, malaria. But what is our scratch on history? And I, I just end by saying, Washington and Adams had this fabulous little saying, um, which was from Addison's Cato, that uh, if we do these things and we work hard, we, we cannot ensure success, but we can deserve it. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening. Bless you. Questions? Answers. So President Alger's giving me the signal that if, if those, anyone's interested and you don't have to rush off either comments, thoughts, ideas, question and answer. So, and yeah, please come to the mics. Oh God, I've paralyzed you and numbed you. Nobody wants to ask any question. <laughs> yes, good. Well, Mr. Bridgman, this is yes, really inspiring. Oh. I'm glad I got over here oh. because there's so much that we're going through in this nation that just brings your spirit down. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to see maybe a week ago Southside and You, uh, a movie about Barack Obama and Michelle mm. Obama mm. and their first date. And it was just one day. <laughs> That was recorded. If you can get to see that movie, you want to do it. Okay. But the, the, the message I got from that movie is that the couple that is now in the White House were really formed by their service to the community. Yeah. And what he saw as important in that community spurred him to go on. Yes and to become a senator at a very young age and then become president. But there was such a touching part of that movie as they went off to a community gathering and they went through a kind of tunnel that had the names of all of these young people who were killed in Chicago. Yeah. It took place in Chicago, the South Side. What you showed us today is that there is a possibility that we can do something to solve a problem that if we look at it, is one of the most difficult problems in our nation at this time. A lot of young people are being killed. Yes. They are killing themselves or they're being killed by a random fire or they're being killed by policemen just today. A 13-year-old boy was shot multiple times, and he had a BB gun. It is unbearable to me to see what is going on in this country. I don't know how I can look 
hopefully upon what we have to deal with uh, when these things happen. Yeah. I'm wondering whether what we're doing with the Valley Scholars can be really implemented throughout the nation mm. so that we can have young people who have a sense of hope where they can move away from the gangs and, and move to a situation where they see that somebody really cares about them. Yeah. So I suppose I've rambled on, but no, I, 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 want, I, I just want to encourage you to do as much as you can in this area because when we sit back here, even in places of hope like James Madison University, but when we understand that we're in national crisis, and if we don't get that message out there, we're going to continue to die. Yeah. So, is there a question? No, I, I can respond. Okay. I actually, that was wonderful. Thank okay. you for, for sharing that. So very specifically, uh, before he was president and senator, he was a community organizer. Some people like joked on the campaign that that was not a legitimate path to public service. Um, but when you work in these communities, <laughs> and you work with faith-based and community institutions and schools and business leaders and nonprofits and government. Um, it's a wonderful education, I think. I mean, when I was in the White House and working on policy, I always insisted on going out to the communities and understanding what the reality was on the ground before we made a final recommendation to the president. Because you get these fancy analyses and experts and ac academics and wonderful stuff, but what is really going on locally and does, does the policy, will it help? So specifically, and uh, the First Lady worked at Public Allies in Chicago, and that was her training ground. And um, so I'm currently working, a, a Secretary of Education, former Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, who could do a lot of things, uh, said I am so worried about these young men and women in the 15 targeted neighborhoods in South Chicago that are really kind of the murder capital of the United States. And so I'm working with Arnie Duncan um, in Englewood, where I just, I just came back to uh, three weeks ago, in Pullman, in these neighborhoods, to look at how can we take these young people. So when Arnie came into our meeting, he said, one of the reasons I'm doing this work is because the children in these neighborhoods say that during the day, they're too scared to play outside. What, what does a community mean when children can't play in their own backyards and in their neighborhoods? And so he's working to build, you know, um, we went outside the place where we were meeting in Englewood and there was a new Whole Foods across the street. And they're actually gonna sell the wares of these opportunity youth in these neighborhoods who were creating things through their art or their music or their, you know, kind of a lifeline to productive work. A big idea was um, David Kennedy, who is part of um, uh, an effort uh, in Boston, created something called the Boston Gun Project. And the theory was that people actually, young people actually need gangs because it's the, the, it's the replacement for the family that they don't have. They need the peers, they need the, the mentors, they need the supports, they need the relationships. But if instead of the focus being on the gun, or in the marketing of an illicit substance, it was on compassion or building a culture around something positive. They did that in Boston. For two years, there wasn't a single homicide across an entire city. So learning from those laboratories of democracy in different places in the country, Arnie and us and others are working to figure out how we bring more economic, social, and other supports to these young people who don't have much in the way of alternative to survive. And then in turn, why not put them into national service, building playgrounds, renovating homes, cleaning up parks, creating safe spaces where people in the community will feel safe. And that partnership has to be, you know, it has to be a partnership with law enforcement, you know, the old community policing, um, and, and the, the Chicago Public Schools, and sort of all, all hands on deck, but I'm so glad you raised it, because I actually think national service is the, you know, you bring black and white and brown and rich and poor and South Side Chicago and North Side Chicago together in common purpose, and all of a sudden you have a different conversation 
then I don't know you, I don't trust you. And so I think it can build social and institutional trust in ways that if we're serious about it as a country, it could really have a transformational effect. So thank you for raising that. Yes. I want to thank you for your very inspirational talk. Um, I had the good fortune this year of being able to retire from my position as a professor at this university, mm. uh, which I am very proud to have served. Um, but I'm still very young, and I have a very strong desire to serve, as do many other people who are young and retired. Yeah. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on establishing a formal second half core or a yeah. retire core. For those of us who would give up, who now no longer have children to raise, yeah. we don't have to set an alarm, and we don't have any obligations that we have, to, but would like to serve. But it needs to be something formalized, because I can't think of my own plan to go to the inner city schools and teach calculus, but I sure would like to do that. Do you have any plans in the works for yes. retired people? Yes, so thank you for raising that. You know, this, Stan wanted to focus on young people, because you get them young, you get them forever. But um, part of what uh, Richard Nixon in, in the... In the um, 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, creates a series of programs called Senior Corps um, for a number of purposes. Uh, older Americans to help vulnerable youth, older Americans to help senior companions, et cetera. And that's a federal program. There are about three to 400,000 older Americans being put to work um, in, in very valuable ways. But there was this great guy, Mark Friedman, who created something called Encore. So if you look at Encore.org, you'll find very concrete, specific opportunities for older Americans, older now including me, over 50, to serve, um, you know, to serve others. And what's great about it is uh, we did a, a nationally representative survey of baby boomers, the silent generation, which is between the boomers, and the greatest generation. And what we found was that the baby boomers feel that they're leaving the world in worse condition that they inherited it, and they really want to give back. And so as we think about national service or significant volunteer service in the country, they're two huge demographics. I mean, if you were like a classic engineer trying to solve a social problem and you were looking for large, low-cost human capital with skills, you'd actually gravitate toward older Americans like you who've been a professor at a fancy university and have a lot of skills. It's, it's the healthiest, longest living, best educated, uh, most highly skilled um, older generation in, in history. And even with current trends, we're not sure boomers will be outpaced in that, sadly. But um, you go to Encore.org, you can find service opportunities. And uh, you know, the greatest generation was really uh, set the pace. And interestingly, when um, the greatest generation was serving, we had the highest levels of voting, volunteering, trust in one another, charitable contributions, community project, joining voluntary associations. And when the greatest generation then, you know, was moving into the really golden years, and this next generation was coming up, a lot of the civic, the indicators of our civic life, Steve and I were talking about this earlier today with this fabulous class, and all the good work he's doing through service learning and the Success Center. Um, you know, what can we concretely do to lift some of those civic indicators? Because that's sort of the bedrock of American democracy. And I know we talk about it theoretically all the time. But like practically, what is it? A community that doesn't have high levels of social and social capital and trust and civic engagement leads to a lot of the problems that you identified. And I think we have to talk about it pretty uh, honestly about it. Yes. Th thank you very much for coming today. I appreciate thank it. You. Um, being an alumni of this awesome school, I am in complete support of going after all the colleges and private and public within Virginia. Yeah. That is also a privilege to go to for a lot of students. What are y'all doing with high schools, specifically? Yeah, good. It's a wonderful question. So, interestingly, the level of American history and civic, in, civic education in American high schools is a little grim. Um, so, when I was in my old job, 
was so interesting. I used to have to go up on Capitol Hill, which wasn't always a pleasant experience. <laughs> and, um, but we convened a meeting around this subject, which, which was um, the education of American high school students around American history and civic engagement. And it was, of all the meetings I've ever had on the Hill, we had um, the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader, Robert Byrd, who at the age of like 89 pulls out his pocket constitution and creates a program called Teaching American History Grants and requires on Constitution Day every high school student in the United States to, to read the Constitution. It's actually kind of a good idea. <laughs> and, and to have a conversation about its relevance to issues today in your community and in your state. John Glenn, a great astronaut, organizes a whole national commission on it. Justice Anthony Kennedy for the Supreme Court shows up to the meeting and says, I'm worried about the dialogue we're having post 9-11. I'm going to create with the American Bar Association something called Dialogues on Freedom. The National Archives and the um, Library of Congress, and I noted, I think this lecture is sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities. We partnered with the National Endowment for the Humanities and created an initiative with archives called Our Documents, where students across the United States could download, download and then read in the original record and as Jim Billington, the Librarian of Congress, always told me, don't have students read the Declaration of Independence. Have them read the original Declaration of Independence with what got struck and what got inserted. And it kind of parries away political correctness and ushers in like what really happened. And um, it's the most popular initiative at the National Archives to this day. Students compete across the country to read and then define and understand in modern context what these great moments in history mean today. Um, and then they're often, often like Steve would have them do, connecting it to service projects in their communities. Um, so we're viewing American high school students as the pipeline to be educated why service is so central to the, you know, the maintenance of the democracy, civic habits over time, their own advancement. Last thing I'll say, sorry, I talk too long sometimes, is um, young people want to see it as a pipeline to a job. And since your service year, when you serve, team building, collaboration with others, working with people who have different views from your own, loyalty to something beyond yourself, people discovering that they're leaders who can speak well and write well and analyze problems, and then they're agents of change. Those are the same skills employers are looking for. So we have 412 employers lined up who are saying, if somebody does a service year, we'll give them a preference, or that will be a benefit in the hiring process. And so from high school to college kids, as they march through the uh, line to employment, the service year is actually relevant. It's not a gap year. It's not a year off. It's not a nice thing. It's like central to, to success in life. Yes. <clears throat> I'd like to start by thanking you for coming. Um, Thanks for having me. When I hear a speech like yours and I hear things like uh, turning communities and self-perceptions of I'm a problem to I'm potential and empowering individuals through these interventions, I feel really inspired, but I also kind of just, I'm a little wary because what is being done to assess like the, lo the long-term effect of these interventions? beyond just like the initial making f people feel good on a service day or just um, changing policy but not really seeing it actually take effect in communities. Good. Are there any assessments that you've seen like standardized Wonderful. both internationally and domestically? Yeah, we need to bring the idea of money ball to government. Remember Billy Bean, Oakland A's, has no budget, hires a data statistician who tells him that it's not the glitz of the athlete, it's not the, even the batting average, it's on base percentages that actually matter in winning games. And with a really low budget, he, he's in the playoffs every year. So we're working on an initiative called Moneyball for Government, and in the context of national service, we have done, um, there are longitudinal studies, and there were two, there they are, the scientists in our earlier session who were pressing on this issue, that show that when you do a service year, in these randomized controlled trials, 
that these people who've had the service year experience, and they're not the self-selectors, it's a, it's a randomized control, they go on to vote, volunteer, participate in community projects, join associations, be more informed, including in politics, than those who have not served. And, um, you know, we need to continue to build more evidence. We did a um, nationally representative survey of 11,000 returned Peace Corps volunteers. What it showed us um, was a, a little discouraging on the impact they were having on public problems in a lot of these places, but transformational in terms of the trajectory of their lives, what they went on to do, their public service careers, as compared to um, those who hadn't uh, served in the Peace Corps. Come on back up. This is a university. We got pull and tug. Yeah, I feel like um, the focus shouldn't really be on assessing the individual experience of the people volunteering and giving their service. Like, I understand um, it creates more active and engaged citizens, and that should always be a goal to strive towards, but my biggest focus would be on just how the, Im the impact of the community. Good, and, wonderful. Um, so on that, Teach for America has done um, randomized control trials and has, has good outcomes with respect to boosting academic achievement. I'm on the board of City Year, and they, um, we created this What Works Clearinghouse at the US, US Department of uh, education. We used to call it the nothing works clearinghouse because literally nothing could pass the rigor that Mathematica had put in place for these, these studies. And uh, City Year Diplomas Now um, project which marries um, education reform and led by Johns Hopkins University, this guy Bob Balfants, together with uh, teams of mentors and tutors that work in tandem with teachers and schools to identify those students who the early warning systems of poor attendance, bad behavior, and off track in, in reading and math have uh, signaled that these young people are in trouble. Those interventions had actually dramatic gains for these young people uh, in these schools that were subject to this randomized control study. So there are, you know, there needs to be more, but they're really good examples of high quality national service programs which have terrific outcomes. The FEMA Corps, um, and not only has good outcomes, but saves taxpayers $60 million a year. So there's also a fiscal benefit in some of these programs that government's funding. But I, even saying all that, I think your point is outstanding, and I think we're really very early in terms of assessments, measuring impact on public problems. I disagree with you that most people who talk, like Stan McChrystal and Bill Buckley and all these people, say that it's not about the public problem solving, it's about fostering habits in young people that will have multiple effects throughout their lives, including employment and civic outcomes. We just disagree, that's fine. Um, and then there's another aspect of, you know, its effect on the culture and the person next to you and the institution that's fostering it. And the nonprofit that all of a sudden is, is you know, ramping up its capacity, not just to serve five people, but 50 people in places like Englewood in the south side of Chicago. Is that Help. Yeah. Um, Come back. This is like the White House press <laughs> corps. This guy's tough. <laughs> uh, I agree wholeheartedly. I'm sure you're familiar with like Maslow's self-actualization and like hierarchy yeah. of needs. But beyond that, um, his wife actually published this after his passing. There's self-transcendence, which is basically when you have achieved self-actualization, you've become the best version of yourself. Hmm. But then you use those skills, that knowledge, all of that to serve others. Yes. And I think it absolutely does foster um, a sense of community to volunteer for a year. And so um, I'm just wondering how can I, as a psych major, as someone who's like curious about assessing these things, get yeah. more involved? And then second part question, if you could give your 21-year-old self any advice beyond serving a year or two, what would you say? Good. So give me your, uh, I'll give you my card and you sh we should be in touch by email. Um, I'd love to connect you to the uh, research team at the Corporation for National Community Service and the Peace Corps, both of which are really good. And uh, my own daughter majored in psychology and is intensely interested in service and the very same questions. And, and maybe we can get a little collaboration going. We'd love that. Um, and you could be, become part of our team. And then if I, I were 21 again, uh, I... Um, you know, I was 41 years old before I discovered what I was sort of built to do in my life. And I guess I'd 
go down not the track that my, you know, my um, father probably, you know, that I thought my father wanted me to go down, uh, but my own track. And uh, I gave a little six-point plan in a, in a class that had been given to me after I left the White House that helped me figure out, you know, what I was supposed to do in life. So I wouldn't get to it at 41. I'd hope to get to it by 21. Okay. What's that? Please stay. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for being here. And I think you can see why, one, we, why we wanted John Bridgeland to kick off our Madison Vision Series this year, and especially to celebrate the Constitution and its living legacy, and, and how fitting that James Madison was here in the room with us the entire time. So, entire time. Uh, by the way, there will be a, a book signing right after this out in the lobby. There are plenty of books, which I believe you will be signing. Is that right? Yeah. So we really appreciate that. Uh, and I just want to remind people that our next installment of the Madison Vision Series will be on November 2nd, just a few days before the election. This is a bit of an experiment. We've been working with the debate team to actually have two people come and debate substantive issues uh, to actually illustrate that that's possible in a <laughs> civil way where you treat each other with respect, even as you disagree about some very fundamental issues. So I hope that you'll come and join us uh, for that celebration of civil discourse and debate on November 2nd. But on behalf of all of us at James Madison University Bridge, this is a small token of our appreciation for your being here. This is a day we will always remember, and we really appreciate how you have helped us to think big and to dream big, which is one of our mottos here. And it's really inspired us and encouraged us to take things to another level. So thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you.